Hello students, this is Evolutionary Reasoning and today I want to extend our argument a little bit. I've talked quite a bit about how mutation contributes to evolution and how selection contributes to evolution. Now I want to give a little bit more explanation of diversification. So this will involve recognizing lack of gene flow. Gene flow can stymie evolution, it can make uh, the evolution all the same throughout the population. But if you have a geographical barrier that separates two subpopulations, then that allows these subpopulations to evolve partially independently, at least for a while. What I want to do is I want to give you just one model for the origin of, let's call them species. There are lots of other models for speciation, but this is one that we think is very plausible and probably responsible for a fair amount of diversification. So we start out then with a population that's, say, on one side of a mountain range, population of plants that's on one side of a mountain range. And then a rare event happens, like there's something that happens that somehow moves some of these seeds from one side of the mountain range to the other side of the mountain range. And this is, is an unusual event. It's not something that happens all the time. It happens and then it doesn't happen. Uh, and so you then end up with two subpopulations that are separated by an, an extrinsic geographic barrier that's not because of anything in their genetics. It's just because of the external environment. And the way that I've set it up here the two environments uh, differ. So on one side of the mountain, on the coastal side of the mountain, the environment is different than on the side of the mountain that's the desert side, on the other side of the mountain where less rain falls. Because the two populations are in two different environments, they each adapt to their own niche. So on the coastal side, there's a longer growing season. Uh, whereas on the desert side, there's a shorter growing season. On the coastal side, the nights are warm. On the desert side, the nights are cold. Uh, on the coastal side, the soils are very fine and uh, they hold the water so they stay moist. Whereas on the desert side, the soil is sand that dries out easily. I'm pretending that on the coastal side, the pollinators are mostly bees whereas on the desert side, I'm pretending the pollinators are mostly flies. The weather is more predictable on the coastal side, whereas on the desert side, there are years that are boom years when there's lots of rain, and then there are other years when there's no rain at all, so they're bust years. On the coastal side, there's lots of other plants, of other species that are growing, and so uh, shade is a problem for the plants whereas uh, on the desert side, sun is a problem for the plants. And let's just pretend that on the coastal side that there's lots of aphids, and the aphids are kind of a drag on the plants, whereas on the desert side, the aphids are not able to live very well. This would then lead to the two populations each adapting to their own niche. So we would then easily imagine how the coastal plants would come to bloom later and for longer, whereas the desert plants, they would bloom and get their whole life cycle over with quickly. The coastal plants would maybe grow only when it's warm, whereas the desert plants would adapt to being able to grow even when it's cold. Coastal plants would have a normal cuticle, a normal waxy skin, whereas uh, the desert plants might get a really thick cuticle that really prevents water loss uh, and also maybe sh keeps them from getting sunburned. Because they differ in their pollinators, the coastal side would have flowers that are, say, violet or lavender, uh, and the desert side might evolve flowers that are pinkish because flies can see red a little bit better than bees can see red. The seeds might just germinate very readily and very easily on the coastal side, but in the desert, the seeds 
might become very resistant to germinating because of those boom and bust years, and they'll only germinate if they like sit in water for two weeks or something like that. On the desert side, the plants might come to be woolly, which would reduce the amount of sun that's hitting the uh, chlorophyll. And then uh, on the desert side, also, it's possible that the plants would um, be very low in defensive chemistry, in secondary chemistry. So you can see, you know, by the scenarios that I've already taught you in previous lectures, how these two populations would diverge. So you'd end up with a situation like this, where you have pink ones on the desert side and lavender ones on uh, the coastal side. So, these two populations have become different in their adaptive traits, uh, and that's something that a taxonomist, a biologist, might recognize and use to call them different species. But we then would wonder, um, are these species that we name as different, are they different in other ways. For instance, are the plants on the coastal side able to interbreed with the plants on the desert side if another rare dispersal event happens and they come back together? Would they be able to interbreed and would they, it be so much interbreeding that it would homogenize the difference? Another question is, uh, have they coalesced so that each of them uh, is their own lineage on the tree of life. So let's take these questions one at a time. We'll take the interbreeding one first. And some of these differences might be ones that themselves would directly be a barrier to interbreeding. Like if they bloom at completely different times of year, then they couldn't interbreed because they never meet each other at the same time when they're blooming. So there could be a temporal isolating mechanism that's caused by directly adapting to different times of year. It's also possible that the niches might have kind of bifurcated. Like if each race is so specialized in the habitat where it can live that it can't live in the other one's habitat, then that would constitute an ecological isolating mechanism. If the coastal ones, pretty much, if they end up in the desert, they're just going to die. And if the desert ones end up on the coast, they're just going to rot. Then that would be a barrier to interbreeding because they wouldn't live together for more than a very short period of time, a generation or two, before this dispersal event was basically made null and void. So those are kind of like direct ways in which you could have a barrier to interbreeding arise. You could also have things that are not quite as direct. So let's say there's correlated responses to selection where you have evolution in some character like, I don't know, how long the flower is adapting to the tongue length of these different pollinators. And that makes it so that the pollen tubes can't grow down to the ovules because like if you cross them, the one that's short flowered, its pollen grains just like they're not used to growing that much, and so they don't grow down all the way to the ovule. So that would be at least a partial reproductive isolating barrier, and it would be not exactly because of a direct effect of the adaptation to the different environments. It would be because of an indirect effect. Now we can get a little bit more indirect if it was something like Maybe the receptors that sense how wet the soil is in the seeds, maybe those receptors are proteins, and those proteins are coded for by the same genes that are used by the egg and the sperm to recognize one another. If that was the case, then divergence in how they germinated could also cause and incompatibility between the egg and the sperm. So you could get this kind of correlated response to selection that is responsible for reproductive isolating barriers between the two nascent species. Okay, so that is 
my answer about the interbreeding. That is, interbreeding could happen at the same time as adaptive divergence, but it wouldn't necessarily have to happen at the same time as adaptive divergence. It could happen after adaptive divergence. It also could happen before you noticed the adaptive divergence. You could have two species that arose uh, on the desert side and the coastal side of the mountains. And we as biologists wouldn't recognize that they're two species. They had come to be unable to interbreed with one another, but it was in no characters that we actually noticed. It was just like in their ability to be intercompatible, the egg and the sperm, or their ability to have pollen tubes that grow down the style in the right way. So just because a biologist recognizes that there's two separate species that you uh, can uh, recognize, that doesn't mean that they have become reproductively two separate species. And just because they become reproductively two different species, that might have happened in a cryptic way so that those cryptic species are not recognized by biologists. Okay, let's move on to this second question. Have the two species coalesced to each be their own lineage on the tree of life? And you can see that the desert one kind of has, right? Like all of those things are a monophyletic group. They uh, are descended from the common ancestor, which uh, lived somewhat after that rare dispersal event. And there's a whole bunch of shared characters that are unique to the desert species. So it's its own lineage. But the ones on the coast, as I've depicted them, you see there's actually coastally one, two, three, four, five different coastal lineages that have all been separate from one another. They're not very different from one another. You don't recognize that they're different. So it's as though they're a parental species that then gave rise to this derivative species that's a desert species. And the way that I've depicted it, the coastal species, it's not a monophyletic group. What that means is if you take all of the coastal ones and you go back to the common ancestor of all the coastal ones, then that common ancestor is also the ancestor of the desert species. So it's a paraphyletic group. At this snapshot in time, the way that I've drawn it. Now, if you let time go on, then what will happen is there'll be some dispersal events among the different populations that are on the coast side. So we might get a little dispersal event here, and that would mean that there would be gene flow among those two coastal populations. And of course, you also get gene flow among the populations on the desert side as well. And as time goes on, all of those populations on the coastal side will coalesce into one lineage. So if we, if we go out in time far enough, then you'll get something like this, where you have a whole bunch of coastal populations. And if you look backwards in time from the coastal populations, then they are related to one another, and their common ancestor is more recent than the common ancestor between the coastal and the desert species. And along the way, you can get uh, new innovations that evolve, that mark these lineages. And so if this had happened, then both the coastal lineage and the desert lineage would each be monophyletic. Now, I used a little terminology there that's a little bit helpful, uh, this word coalescence. And what coalescence means, it's when you look backwards in time from the present day, then it's the coming together of the alleles in a common ancestor. And uh, that takes time. It also doesn't happen all at the same moment for all the different uh, loci. So you'll have some genetic loci where there's coalescence that is not very far back in time, and you'll have other genetic loci where the coalescence is very, very deep. 
So what this means is that the coming to be of monophyletic groups, of lineages that are whole and complete, that's something that happens gradually over time. And it doesn't happen necessarily at the same time as the reproductive isolating barriers between these incipient species. And it also doesn't necessarily happen at the same time as the characters arise that allow us as biologists to recognize the different species. So let me sort of reword this. The various aspects of differentiation need not happen simultaneously. Uh, of course, if you go out long enough, then everything that marks something as a species has happened. But if you just look at very, very closely related species, then one of these things can have happened, but the other might not have. So you could have local adaptation, but not have bifurcation of the niche. Or you could have bifurcation of the niche, but not have coalescence. Or you could have barriers to interbreeding, but not have the differences be so obvious that we as biologists would recognize that speciation has occurred. Another way to think about this is, and it's kind of a little bit of a riddle, I think every generation of students has to stumble over this, just because you've had speciation occur doesn't mean that you have two species. Like having two species would be biologists recognize it, and speciation occurring, I guess, would be that uh, there's been uh, intrinsic reproductive isolating barriers that have arisen that are genetically based that keep the things from interbreeding with one another. And the converse is true. Just because you can recognize them as different doesn't mean that the differences represent an inability to interbreed with one another or that they represent these lineages having coalesced into being each their own monophyletic group. Now, I'd like to reiterate that this is just one of many models of diversification, that evolution happens in lots of different ways, not just this way. But this is one that we think is uh, highly plausible. Like you can go out and get lots and lots of data to show that this happens. And it's probably pretty frequent uh, in certain groups of organisms. Uh, of course, it would be different in different groups of organisms. So ferns might be different uh, than trees. And, and salamanders might be different than geckos. And ferns definitely might be different than salamanders in what happens in this diversification process. So in addition to mutation and selection, um, the evolutionary process involves lack of gene flow that's due to geographic isolation. And those extrinsic barriers then become intrinsic barriers eventually if the evolutionary process goes on long enough. Another way to kind of think about it or a sound bite would be that speciation is usually a process. It is extended over a long period of time. It's not usually an event. It could be an event, but it doesn't have to be an event. And that's all that I have to say about that. <laughs>